Hello again and welcome again to PLG Disrupt Day 2. We have a very special session today with Francisco Bram, Head of Global Product Marketing at Uber, who will be talking about driving product innovation through customer insights. Welcome, welcome. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. So it is a fact that understanding your consumers' needs and wants has become essential to ensure your product is future proof. Listening to your audience and collecting user insights empowers product marketers and product managers to build customer centric products and services. So in this session, my dear crowd by PLG Disrupt, Francisco Bram, head of global product marketing at Uber, will share a framework for collecting user insights, sprinting minimum viable products through design thinking and launching them. So now the floor is yours, dearest Francisco. Enjoy. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Francisco Bram, and I'm excited to be here today and just share with you some of the insights about um, working at Uber, but also what drives Uber to come up with product innovation. Uh, and it's really an entire partnership of product marketing, marketing, sales in, in the case of B2B, and then, of course, engineers and product managers. But product innovation you know, a lot of people interpret the word innovation very differently. And so I want to start with a little story. And I want to give a little bit of context in terms of how I define innovation and how I believe businesses should define innovation. So first off, in my personal opinion, innovation and pioneering are two separate things. A lot of people think if you're first to come up with a product and you're first to go to market, you're the pioneer and therefore you're innovative. I don't believe that's the case. I think you can be first to market, but you can totally miss the mark and not truly innovate the market. A few examples. Maybe a lot of you know Google today. You know, Google started with the name Backrub and then eventually became Google. But Google was not the first search engine to exist. The first one was called Archie Query Form. And a lot of people don't even know that. They were the pioneers, but they did not innovate. Same thing with the MP3 player, the, the Apple iPod totally innovated the market, yet AT&T Flashback was the real first MP3 player. Nobody even heard of it. And then, of course, MySpace. I think more people heard of MySpace than the other two products, and they truly were the pioneer. But it wasn't until Facebook came along that truly innovated the way we connect with people. And today, with over 2 billion people connected in one social network and expanding to other areas, they truly revolutionized the market. But the best example of pioneering being different from innovation is behind one very cool expression. The expression is the best thing since sliced bread. I'm not sure if you've ever heard this expression, but if you haven't, basically, if there's something really exciting and new, a lot of people in the United States or England, they tend to say that's the greatest thing since sliced bread. For example, um, the latest iPhone, way, that's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Or the Tesla you know, electric vehicle, that's the greatest thing since sliced bread. But the interesting thing about this expression is the, uh, the, the beginnings of sliced bread. You see, it all started in 1912 when Otto Rehweather, a German scientist that lived in the United States, they came up with the first ever sliced bread making machine. Now, you may think, why? Why do you need to slice bread? Why do you need a machine to slice bread? Well, Otto believed there's a better way to slice bread. There's a better way to ration bread. He actually did a lot of trials. He tested the product. He finally patented the product and came up even with his own company. And then he went from door to door, tried to convince people that, you know, buy my slice bread machine because with slice bread, bread making machine, you can optimize bread. And yet for the first 15 years, his product did not take off. For the first 15 years, the market did not see the value of sliced bread. It wasn't until 1930 when a company called Wonder from Illinois, the company saw the, the patented device and partnered with Otto, but instead of just launching the product, they decided to learn about the market. They decided to spend time researching the market. And so they were able to understand that there's three segments in the market, the bakeries, the supermarkets, and the households. And then they really spent time understanding the pain points and needs of each individual segment. The bakeries, they knew that, you know, this was back in 20, 1929, 1930s. Remember, the biggest depression in history of the United States and in the world 
where bread became the most sought out product. Yet it was very expensive to make bread at the time. Supermarkets, they were competing with bakeries. So they needed to make sure that their bread is as equally fresh as the bakeries. And then the households, they actually did a study and with focus groups, and they found out that a housewife cuts on average 20 slices of bread per day. So they came up with a very creative strategy. They created very tailored marketing. They truly started to innovate the market by creating advertisements specific to each segment. They started with B2B bakeries. So they said, you know what? We are launching sliced bread, and we will deliver to you fresh bread every day delivered to your bakery. So you don't have to worry about not having enough bread to you know, provide your clients with bread, especially in this crisis when everyone wanted bread. Then they went to the bakeries, uh, sorry, to the supermarkets. And they said to the supermarkets, this bread will last longer in shelves. It is six hours fresher than ever before. And so you can actually compete with the bakeries. But then they really spent all their advertisement with the consumer. They went to the mothers and said, Bread, sliced bread, can make children healthier. They actually promoted it and said, Wonder Bread built stronger bodies in eight different ways. They actually calculated all eight different ways. They said, sliced bread can make better muscle, better bones and teeth, body cells, blood, appetite, growth, brain, energy. Clearly, the FDA did not regulate any of this at the time because obviously there's no evidence for any of it. And But this was so successful convincing people that the next year they said there's 12 different ways sliced bread can actually make your children stronger with vitamin B12 and red cells and tissue respiration or, or reparation. They really went all in to a point where they actually made sliced bread the most sold product in supermarkets. And today, in our world today, you go to supermarkets and you'll find shelves and shelves of multiple types of sliced bread. So what's the key takeaway from this story? Otto was the pioneer. He was the product manager, the engineer, the inventor. He came up with the idea, he did the trials, he tested, he filed for a patent, but he failed to innovate the market. It wasn't until Wonder that came in, researched the market, uncovered insights, segmented the market, built a customer journey, and then built personalized messaging that they were actually able to truly, truly disrupt the market. So that's the difference in my mind from pioneering and innovation, but they can both go hand in hand. And that's what I wanna share with you today. The examples at Uber and how you can combine pioneering technology with innovation and actually launch truly disrupted market uh, or product innovations. So first off, Uber. One of the things at Uber that we're really strong about and really passionate about is our commitment to make big, bold bets. That is presence across you know, all of our entire platform. If you remember 10 years ago, Uber was nothing more than you order a car to pick you up as a replacement for a taxi from your phone. Today, we are present in 10,000 cities, 69 countries. We have 5 million active drivers and over 103 million active users. I mean, this was prior to COVID. Of course, today, not a lot of people are riding Uber because people are still quarantined. But before COVID, we had over 103 million active users every day. So that's a massive platform. Not only that, we built such a great product and platform that you can actually order a vehicle in most cities in less than five minutes, a car will show up to pick you up. That's an average time for most cities. But we are not just a rides company. We kept making big, bold bets to a point where today we have Uber rides, Uber Eats, if you want to have food delivered to you, we are partnering with transit companies. So you can actually, you know, book a train or book a, a bus directly from the Uber app. We have Uber Freight. So trucks, if you want to transport things from one place to another, we have that capability. We have Uber Delivery. If you want to deliver groceries, alcohol, pharmaceuticals, if you want to deliver your jeans, we have that capability today as well. And we have that product. Uber for business. How do we then help companies manage their employees and their customers? We have cars that are self-drive vehicles. We are betting a lot on Uber Elevate. We have in New York, Uber Copter. We can actually you know, take an Uber Copter from Manhattan to the airport in just 15 minutes. And then of course, Uber Health, which is how do we help hospitals make sure patients get transportation to and from the hospital? So we make big, bold bets, but we won't stop here. We really wanna make is an operating system for your everyday life. 
So you open up the Uber app and then you can order a ride, you can order food, you can order groceries, you can order your, your medication, you can order a bike, just transit. Today, this already exists in the United States. Today in the United States, you can get your pharmacy delivered, you can get groceries delivered, you can get food, you can get rides. All of this is available today in the United States and our goal is to expand globally to really make it so that it's a modern day operating system. But now let's go about the second commitment that we have at Uber, which is we are customer obsessed, meaning we start with customer and we end with customer. But at the heart of all of that is data. And why is it so important that we use data? Because data rules technology. It's no longer technology is built, data comes after. No, today is data first, technology later. Here's an example. It took 68 years for an airline to reach 50 million passengers. It took 62 years for automotive companies to have 50 million drivers. It took six years for Uber to reach 50 million monthly active riders. So how do we move that so quickly? How do we get more and more people to use this so quickly? It is because of something that it's really at the heart of our business. We work tirelessly to earn customers' trust in business by solving their problems. We use data to understand them, communicate, and delight them. So I'm gonna give you a few examples of how we do that, but before, let me show you how the organization is built around data. These are the four core teams that we have in our organization that helps product marketing, helps product managers and engineers to really build true innovation. It starts with data science. Data science, they look at internal user data and customer data. They understand user behavior, demographics, and economics. They, you know, we have 103 million users. They go and slice and dice our data to understand them more and more so that we can cater better products to them. You have UX research. UX research investigates customer journey. They actually test products. They, they come up with MVP lines of products and goes and measures them. We also have research and insights. How do we build better stories to tell our customers which verticals or segments we want to investigate? And then marketing analytics, which marketing tactics are working that we should keep investing on and which ones are not and we should deprecate. And we do this so that we can really ideate all the time. At Uber, in the last nine months, I've launched more products than I have at my previous company for three years. And that's because we're constantly coming up with new ideas and ideate, ideate, ideate. So product marketing works really closely with product managers to do what I call minimal viable products or design thinking. It's really all about understanding the problem, empathizing with your audience. Like what problems are you trying to solve? Why is this a problem? Go to the five whys that this is a problem understanding that you need evidence to show that this problem is real. What are the implications that the problem is not solved? Why hasn't anyone else solved the problem? And you can do this with a lot of methodologies. Once you understand the problem, then you really start defining exactly the vertical or industry where this problem could be better solved for. Once you do that, you understand the decision makers, the users, and you start to ideate what solutions you can build to solve that problem for those users. And then you create a prototype. Then you test that prototype. That's what we call that MVP product. And then once you test it, you can eventually release it into the market. Now, at the bottom is just a rough timeline, but you can do this in a matter of like two to three months. And so Uber is constantly launching and piloting products. And that's why we're constantly expanding um, to new areas and new verticals. So I'm gonna give you two examples today of how we apply these principles and these methodologies to actually launching innovations. And I'm gonna give you two examples that I managed. There's a lot more examples that Uber has done, but I didn't manage. So I wanna share with you today what, uh, what me and my team were responsible for launching and how we work closely with product and engineering by providing them insights to really build innovative products. So the first one is business travelers. So when I joined Uber, this report came out and this report basically said that Uber was the most expensed vendor in 2018, meaning everyone that was like making expenses or reporting expenses to their companies, they, the majority of the expenses was because of Uber. So this was interesting to me because I asked the question that why are we not investing more products for this audience? Because it seems like Uber was very much centered around consumers but consumers don't do expenses. Business travelers do expenses. 
So what are the products we have for business travelers? So we didn't have it because we didn't understand it. So the first step that I did was let's get together with data science. So we got together with data science. We look at all of our 103 million users and we started to slice and dice the data. Number one, what riders have a corporate card on file? Why do we, why does it matter? Because if you have a corporate card on file, that means you are likely to be working for a company and you're traveling and paying for those rides with the business card. So that means you're a business travel. So then you belong in this, what we call business traveler lookalike model. Then let's look at their behavior. How many users go from you know, homes to airports frequently? How many of them go from airports to hotels frequently? How many of them travel internationally? Meaning how many of them actually have a lot of rides outside of the country on a re regular basis? We started putting all of this together and we found that about 25% of all of our users behave like business travelers. It doesn't mean that they are business travelers, but they behave that way. So this was really insightful because now we knew there's a lot of users that we could target with better solutions, but we need to understand their journey. So the next step was to get together with UXR. First was data science, now we went to UXR and we started doing focus groups. We started getting together with people that behave like business travelers and interviewing them and getting together in the room and built the entire journey. How do you, you know, what are your pain points before you get into a vehicle, before you go to the airport? What are the pain points when you arrive at the airport? What are the pain points when you want to arrive at an event or a customer meeting? What are the pain points when you then arrive in a different country? And then when you arrive home. So throughout the entire journey, we wanted to map out what are you doing? How are you feeling? What do you think during this process? What problems do you have? And what are the opportunities? From there, we wanted to then start to work with research and insights to identify personas. Now that we know the journey, we know how many there are, we need to know if they all behave the same way or if they all behave a little bit differently. And we found out that there's four types of personas, the jet setters, the road warriors, the locals and the techies and newbies. Jet setters are experienced travelers, you know, between the ages of you know, 35 and 54, they tend to be VPs or C-level people at, at companies and they travel with business class. So they have a certain type of behavior. Road warriors are consultants or salespeople. They're constantly on the road. They constantly are trying to close projects, you know, close deals. Um, and so they behave differently than the executives. The locals are people that travel only within the city where they live in. They could be accountants, they could be lawyers, but they are traveling all the time within that city. And then you have the techies and newbies. These are new people that join the tech company and they're traveling to you know, be part of workshops or to be part of you know, company outings. They're normally entry-level people, junior consultants, and they behave differently too. They are more tech savvy than the traditional ones. So with all this information, we started to capture additional insights, travel policy, personal time, ride hailing, all of this was really important for us to understand them more and more. So we started building a very detailed understanding of each one of them. What is the highest spending category, their needs, their pain points, what do they value, behavior, what channels do they use? Channels that they use to communicate is really important because you want to tell them about your products, but you need to understand exactly what they use to talk uh, for your product. Then you build out what I call a customer profile. You really classify, you go into specifics of each one of them, your priorities, goals, frustrations, um, and you do that for each individual one. And with that in mind, we started to build products specifically designed for business travelers. We made sure that business profiles were something that it shows up in the Uber, Uber app. What is a business profile? Allows you to actually switch between personal and business so that if you're traveling for business, you automatically pay with your corporate card. You don't have to select different cards. It's automatically done. And you get also the ability to connect to your company's expensing system so that every trip is automatically expensed. You never have to worry about receipts. You never have to worry about expensing those trips. We take care of that for you. In addition, we started to also work with companies to build policies to tell you whether or not a certain vehicle that you want to use um, is within company policy so that you don't have to worry about, hey, I, I used a vehicle that was not a company policy, now I have to justify it. So we help you do that. In addition, we also help develop products that are better for you. Comfort, for example, based on what we learned from business travelers, has extra legroom. You have highly rated drivers. You can personalize your settings. You can say, I want you know, the, the, the climate to be cool or hot. You can say, I don't want to talk to the driver. I don't want the music on because I want to work. So all of this can be done in the app so that you, when you arrive as a business traveler, everything is ready for you. 
So that's one product we built, but we also learned that they care about points. So we made sure that you know you have a, a very quick way of signing up for our rewards program so you can get more and more points. And because we know that there's a lot of corporate cards that are American Express. American Express is one of the uh, predominant corporate cards, for example, in the United States. We did a partnership with American Express so that you can get extra points if you pay for Uber trips with American Express. And if you are in a sea level, a jet setter, if you're a jet setter, then not only you get extra points, but you get priority pick at the, at the airports and you get the best drivers available to you because we know that's what you care about the most. So we built an entire sort of part of the portfolio designed specifically for these particular users. And then we made sure we targeted them throughout our app. We told them when they're driving to the airport, hey, there's comfort ready for you. If you are uh, in the vehicle, we told you stuff like, hey, do you want to create a business profile? Hey, is this a business trip? So we constantly communicate with you. And also, we made sure that that communication is tested. We want to test the best messages that will you know, drive the most engagement with you. So we constantly do A-B testing. And then we go and use marketing analytics to tell us what messages actually work the best. And that's really important for us as well. Ultimately, from doing all of this research and putting all of this package together, we're able to drive 4.5 million new users and we increase the amount of business trips, billings and bookings in our platform. So tremendous success from really taking data, research and insights and driving product innovation. Now, let's move over from rides to food because that's another business line that we have that we also need to support. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with Uber Eats, but Uber Eats is currently present in you know, 6,000 cities, 36 countries. We have over 400,000 restaurants, restaurant partners in our platform. And on average, in most cities, you can get a meal delivered in less than 30 minutes. But this was built as a consumer platform. So we wanted to know if there is a market for businesses, for companies. Think about what if a company wants to deliver food for their employees, and instead of having a cafeteria, or instead of having employees leave the office, what if we deliver the food to them? Is there a need for it? Is this a market we should be investing? So again, let's go back to data. First thing we want to know is the total addressable market. How big is this market for corporate meal delivery and how much should we target? So we were able to look at market data and understand that the market in general is $239 billion in, in corporate meal delivery. In fact, meals are the second most expensed line item after, after um, you know, hotels and so on, meals are the second most expensive item. So Uber is actually leading on most expense items as well, both on rides and food. So then we wanted to learn about the users, their journey. So we found out that you know, a lot of them, they bring food from, from home to the office, but one out of four employees actually leaves the office and goes looking for a restaurant to eat. So this is important to know because if they leave the office to go and eat at a restaurant, they might need more time. They need time to drive, they need time to find a restaurant, they need time to sit down, they need time to eat and pay and then come back. So it's a lot of time spent that maybe we can save the company's money, save the employee's time by delivering the food to them. So we wanted to know that as well. And we also learned that 70% of employees didn't even know if the company covers meals or not and how much does it cover. So with that information in mind, we started calculating what is the pain point and so we found out that on average, employees spend between 15 and 32 hours a month, 15 to 32 hours a month, just because you don't offer meals directly to them with Uber Eats, because they spend 10 hours on average finding a meal or restaurant. They spend an average of five to 21 hours eating the meal. And then they spend an average of 30 minutes to an hour expensing the meal. So we can take care of all of that and save you literally almost 30 hours because we can deliver food directly to your office in less than 30 minutes. And you don't have to expense the meal, it's automatically expensed in the background. So we also learned because of COVID that, you know, during our research, employees, they want to avoid restaurants. Even when they go back to the office, they still are afraid to go to restaurants. 68% of them said, they, even when they have to go back to the office, they want to avoid restaurants. Um, they want to keep tables separated. They want to keep social distancing. That's great insights because then again, food delivery solves for this problem too. So we started learning about who they are and we learned the different personas, the CEOs or the financial managers of small companies or office administrators that actually make decisions for employees or travel and HR managers that manage sort of meals for their entire you know, employee population. 
we started to get more and more insights in terms of how companies behave and who makes decisions about those, those meals. We haven't built a product yet. We're just learning about it. And that's really why it's so important to invest time in research and insights. So we built models for every single persona. Here's an example of someone who you know, looks for food retention, that, that is looking to improve sort of uh, executive team outings. Um, and then you can see exactly where their mindset is, what their pain points are. And we did this for every single use case. You have multiple examples of different mental models that really helps us build the product and the messaging for marketing. So very high level summary, what we learned was it's a very competitive market, but it's a big market. We should definitely invest in the market. Uh, we've also learned that there's a lot of inefficiencies in this market. Um, you know, it's the, the most, it's the second most expense business item. And yet employees spend a lot of time expensing um, these meals. We also learned that employees are very happy when companies allow them to have the flexibility of having food delivered to their office. We've also learned that most employees don't know what the company policy are, is around meals. So we can solve for that. Um, we can solve for expensing. We can solve for the amount of time it takes to go and find a restaurant. We can really ultimately save time and money for the business and improve the employee experience at the company. So then we built a product. We went ahead and we launched in April this year uh, what we call Uber Eats for Business. How do we build Uber Eats for Business? We have to think first, this is a B2B product. We have to help the decision makers that we identified solving for their employees. So it's very straightforward. Number one, you sign up for Uber for Business. You go in and you create a meal program. In that meal program, you can decide when will employees be able to order meals and have that um, you know, expensed and be part of the company policy. Number two, which employees will have access to this? Is it the entire employee population or is it just some employees? How much are you willing to pay? You can define exactly how much you will cover per meal. You can say, I will cover 100%, or you can say, I'll cover 50%, or you can say, I'll cover up to $100, and then the employee will cover the rest. You can also say what times of the day those meals are in policy and what times of the day they are not in policy. And you can also define the area where those restaurants can be served. You can say, only within five miles from our headquarters or 10 kilometers from our headquarters, can employees order meals from? Because if they order from somewhere that is 20 miles away or 20 kilometers away, that's going to take longer, so it's going to be more expensive. So you can actually control all of that, create those policies, and then employees can be invited to this program by simply signing up to their app. They open up the Uber Eats app, they select the meal, they turn from personal to business, business profile, and when they select business profile, they will know how much the company is willing to pay or not. And if they try to book a meal outside the company policy, we will not let them do it. So let's say they want to order a meal and they want to order a meal at four o'clock. But the company says, no, we only allow you to order meals if it's between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. So we will tell them, look, look, if you want to order a meal at four, you got to switch to your personal profile and pay with your own personal card. If you want to order a meal between seven and 10, you can order delivery now, but it will not arrive until that time because that's when the company has defined the policy for you. So very clearly, now we're solving for expensing. We're solving for the employee not knowing what the company policy is. Now it's very clear it's in front of them. We're solving for meals delivered to the office. We're also solving for um, you know, the ability to control how much employees spend and how much employees should be um, expending. With all of this in mind, we had the research, we had the product ready, then we built the entire go-to-market plan. Starting off, of course, with audience insights, building sales training, because this is a B2B product, we have, to, we have to sell to companies, we have to educate and empower and enable our sales team. So we built sales materials, presentations, case studies, we built a marketing toolkit. What is a marketing toolkit? A marketing toolkit is really the ability for anyone else across the country or across the globe where we are present to take what we built and localize it, translate it, and then launch the same campaign. It's really all the insights, the training materials, the marketing materials, templates for advertisement, templates for uh, social media, everything put together. We, we built that and we give it out to them so they can then roll it out in their home country. We then do, of course, CRM emails. We do ads on LinkedIn. We do ads on Facebook. We do ads on search engines like Google. We do webinars to let you know decision makers know that we have a product for them. 
we did a lot of thought leadership content like ebooks, which is gated. Gated means if you want to download this particular ebook, you have to provide us with your contact information because then we'll take that information, feed it into salesforce.com, and then our, it becomes a marketing lead so that sales teams can then follow up and potentially close a deal. We did a lot of PR and media. We cross selling to the app and, and website, and then eventually demanded a lot of generation. And we did blog posts so that we really truly communicated to each individual persona the value of this product based on the research that we came up with. Ultimately, this today, right now, is the best performing product in B two B, and it's again a product that you know up until April we didn't have globally. It was because of research, understanding your customers, understanding your product. Um, it is all about spending time analyzing data and then using that data to build a innovative product and market that innovative product the same way that Wonder Bread did with a slice breading machine, except that we start with data, we don't begin with the product. So ultimately, I think if you really spend time um, investing in data, spend time learning about your customers and product marketers, really, if there's a lot of product marketers out there listening to this, it's really your role to provide insights to inform product managers and engineers to build the best products. It's really our job to go out there, learn as much as we can, come up with a great product and launch that product so that your product can be the greatest thing since sliced bread. Thank you. So I don't know if there's any questions. Hello again. Hello. Uh, thank you for uh, this inspiring talk. Uh, I really admire Uber and your practices. Uh, so let's hop into the questions. We have a, a very interesting question from the audience. Uh, what methods or means would you advise to gather quantitative data insights when the company is a startup with little data to analyze and with no data scientist, UXR, and research team? As a PM wearing all these hats, product discovery feels overwhelming. Yeah, so it's a great question. Of course, you know, everything I shared, um, it, it, is, it is, you know, a, uh, an, an illustration of how big the company is. But Uber wasn't always this big. Uh, I think if you're a startup and you're looking at coming up with the next innovative solution, you still have to know what problem you're trying to solve. And how do you know what problem you're trying to solve? You need to go out there and learn about the people that you're trying to solve the problem for. So one way to do it is you can, there's a lot of tools like, you know, you can do SurveyMonkey. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll tell you an example, like there's people that use SurveyMonkey to try to test the names that they should give to their children, like before the baby's born. Oh. That's very cheap to do. You can actually survey a thousand people and only mm -hmm. pay maybe a hundred dollars or a little bit over a hundred dollars. You can decide how much you're going to pay per person, and you mm -hmm. can start doing like these customizable surveys. And like SurveyMonkey, there's a bunch of other companies out there. You can just Google like you know uh, survey tech companies, and you can find a lot of companies. And what they do is they pay people like me, let's say a dollar or two dollars, to just answer a five-minute survey. Yeah. But yeah. Just by doing that, you get thousands of people responding. So you can you can learn about behaviors, you can learn about testing. If you have the ability, you can also invite some of those people that responded to the survey that you found that they were most interesting, and you can pay them to actually you know come to your office, whatever that office is, and maybe it's your home, and just do a customer focus group where you test your product. You can get them to sit down with you, and you test it, and you get their feedback, and you, you evolve their product that way. Another way of doing it is looking at existing data that is out there. Mm. You can look at market reports. Uh, you can do, you, you know, I've, 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 in the past, I've done a lot of research just by looking at research that already exists. I, I pulled data and I started triangulating data. I looked at reports about the market. I looked reports about uh, specific, you know, industries. And then I look at reports about specific uh, businesses within that industry. Mm -hmm. um, some of those reports are free. Some of you need to pay. But I think today, there's no shortage of data. You just have to spend a lot of time investigating the best method for you. Mm -hmm. Very nice answer. Thank you so much. Uh, do you have to recommend any best practices to monitor and optimize the user journey in B2B versus B2C products? Um, well, 
I think you always need to do A-B testing, to be honest. So mm. if you want to know if you're really reaching your audience the best way, at Uber, for example, we never do, we never le release a marketing campaign uh, or even a product without doing A-B testing. We normally go out and say, there's a control group, there's a treatment group. If mm -hmm. there's no issues or no challenges in the control group, or sorry, in the treatment group, then two weeks later or maybe a month later, we release it to the entire population. Mm -hmm. So I think it doesn't matter if it's consumer or B2B, you should always um, do A-B testing. In mm -hmm. B2B, I think it's actually even easier to do A-B testing because you have more channels than consumer. In B2B, you have a sales team a lot of the times. So you can take an opportunity and talk to your account managers and say, in your next meeting with your customers, do you mind if we ask them about the product, if we ask them about our narrative, is this message working or what should we improve? Um, so you have that channel. In addition, you have the ability to do webinars. That's another way to constantly test um, whether or not you're building the right products, whether or not your, your message is resonating. Mm -hmm. And then you have all these other channels in addition to the consumer channels, like for example, very specific groups on, on, on LinkedIn, for example. LinkedIn actually lets you do firmographic information. Firmographic information is you can decide, you can select people in LinkedIn based on their title, their job title, based on their company size, and then you can test different messages. Um, mm -hmm. and you can see what works and what doesn't work. So throughout the entire journey, you can use all those different channels to actually constantly optimize your product and messaging. Hmm, that's very interesting. So besides quantitative methods, because from what I heard right now, it's uh, quantitative, uh, the method you use to uh, op monitor and, op and optimize the journey. Do you also use qualitative methods in order to assess it? Like yeah, focus groups it, or uh, interviews? There's, there's no such thing as uh, research without qualitative. Hmm. Everything I presented to you was a combination of both. We did focus groups and focus groups it's all qualitative data because mm -hmm. focus groups are groups of five people. So that's not statistically significant. Yes. For statistically significant, we do what we call omnibus surveys and quantitative mm -hmm. surveys. But you always do focus groups because that's where you get the true authentic emotion out of your, your customers. And so that's really important. And then you can retest these emotions quantitatively, of course. That's exactly. So then yeah. you you learn from those qualitative uh, inputs, and then you go out and test those qualitative inputs statistically with a quant. Mm. Impressive. Okay, so I really want to thank you for your contribution. Your presentation was really amazing, and of course, your insights and knowledge is tremendous. Thank you for your answers, and uh, well, I really wish you all the best, and that we meet again in the future. Thank you, everyone, and feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Super. Bye-bye. Right. Take care. OK, so at this moment, uh, I would like uh, to talk to you about the next session. Um, unfortunately, uh, Ms. Nancy Wong, the head of data protection services at Amazon Web Services and the CEO of Advancing Women in Product, she will not be available to join us live today. However, uh, she will uh, provide us with her presentation, uh, her pre-recorded presentation that will be available and the uh, instructions will be given to all of you uh, in order to access it, view it, and of course, enjoy it. At this point, since this was our last and closing keynote, I would like uh, to um, say a big thank you uh, to PLG Hub for organizing this event. It was a great pleasure having you all as our crowd here. It was an amazing experience running this conference with you. It was indeed a uh, two long days packed full of knowledge and insights from industry experts on product-led growth. I hope that you all enjoyed it and I hope that you got answers to your questions. So from us, a big thank you and a big promise that we will meet again. Well, we hope that we will meet again physically next year, 2021, for another PLG Disrupt conference. So thank you all. Have a great day, great night, and enjoy your life. Bye-bye from us.